Good evening, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ron Eidenberg. I'm a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at Simon Fraser University. And it's my very pleasant duty as chair of the Sterling Prize Committee to be here this evening in the Native Education College in Vancouver, as well as streaming online to present SFU's 2020 Nora and Ted Sterling Prize in support of controversy. We have closed captioning available for today's event. You can turn it off and on by clicking the CC button on the black bar at the bottom of your screen. It should be on your right. I'd also like to acknowledge that we're gathering on the unceded traditional Coast Salish lands, including the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam nations. The Sterling Prize is unique in the world. It's the result of the vision and generosity of Nora and Ted Sterling, who in 1993 established an endowment at Simon Fraser University to recognize work that provokes or contributes to the understanding of controversy. To opening this evening's ceremony and bid an official welcome, I'd like to welcome uh, Elder Margaret George. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the territory of the uh, First Nations in Vancouver, Coquitlam, Squamish, and Musqueam and Tisaiwatus. A very quick prayer and you can get your event going. Great Spirit, protects each and every one who is present this evening at this meeting and their families and just clear the path as they work forward. I ask Great Spirit just a very special blessing this evening on my relations. Thank you, Elder Margaret. As I mentioned, Nora and Ted Sterling established the endowment that supports the prize in 1993. The award is given annually, and I'd like to share a short video that tells us more about the prize. I undertook a study on the question of whether the Canadian state is culpable for crimes of genocide. What is the legal meaning of the limited definition of genocide in the criminal code? So basically it means whether the Canadian state violates customary international laws on genocide. The acts of genocide that I focused on in my legal research was looking at the forcible transferring of children via the residential school system and the present day child welfare systems in Canada. At the end of the legal research, uh, it was determined that uh, yes, the Canadian state does violate customary international laws on genocide and that they are criminally culpable for crimes of genocide. Canada was instrumental in having cultural genocide deleted from the UNGC or the Genocide Convention. When they were drafting the crime from 1946 to 48, they were helping to draft this crime in international law. It's there in black and white that Canada evaded the concept of cultural genocide. Government reports describe the residential school system wrought with abuse, physical, emotional, sexual abuse, neglect, mistreatment, inadequately fed, which are all euphemisms. A more accurate way to describe what happened in those institutions and what still takes place is torture, forced starvation, forced labor, sexual predation, and death by disease and dilapidated living conditions. Canada has not examined the legal issue of international laws on genocide in its own domestic courts, which leaves Indigenous peoples and nations, the original nations and peoples, vulnerable because they have no recourse. We belong within the family of nations. We're subjects of international law. Why would the Canadian state go to such great measures to define genocide in international law or help and engage in crimes in its own domestic border? This is all about the land because the state and society has benefited from claiming our lands, stealing our lands, claiming underlying title to lands that they don't have or possess. First, I think that the genocide needs to stop. 
in all its various forms. What should happen next is that the peace and friendship treaties created between the Crown and the Indigenous nations, or the original nations, for example, where I come from, the, the Nehiyaw or Cree, they should be implemented according to the original spirit and intent. I think the next steps would be having an open discussion in Canada and also globally because this doesn't just affect Indigenous peoples and nations in Canada. The terms of reference for the prize written by the Sterlings are as follows. The Sterling Prize may be awarded for work in any field, including but not limited to the arts, humanities, social sciences, natural sciences, and education. To be eligible for the prize, the work must be the object of or present a meaningful analysis of the conduct or consequences of controversy. However, the work must be more than simply controversial. It should present new ways of looking at the world, be daring and creative, decidedly unconventional and distinctly untraditional. In short, the Sterling Prize celebrates work that challenges complacency. It must also meet recognizably high standards and be morally and ethically sound. There's a call for nominations made each year. The, nominations for the call for nominations for next year's prize will be made later this month. A committee is struck and gathers in the course of the spring to consider the nominations. And in the course of much discussion, it eventually comes to a consensus decision. The committee is meant to be broadly representative of our institution as a whole. The membership turns over each year and includes students, staff, faculty, men and women, and diverse backgrounds, the intention being that it represents our institution as a whole. I'd be remiss if I did not thank the members of this year's committee for their service. Dr. Jan McLean, who's senior lecturer in the Department of the Faculty of Education. Chris Deckert, who is a communications and public relations manager in Hellenic Studies. Aaron Barley, senior lecturer in the Department of Biological Sciences. Seth Aris, program co coordinator for SFU Public Squared. And Matt McDonald, who's the director of external relations for the SFU Graduate Student Society. I'd now like to ask Dr. Jonathan Driver, SFU's Vice President and Provost Pro Tem to say a few words and introduce the recipient of the 2020 Nora and Ted Sterling Prize in support of controversy. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And thanks to those of you who are joining us online and welcome also to our very small uh, in-person audience at the Native Education College. Uh, I too would like to acknowledge that we are gathering today on the unceded traditional Coast Salish lands, including the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam nations. It's a great pleasure to be a guest of the Native Education College, and I particularly want to thank all the staff here who have helped make this event happen, uh, as well as my colleagues from SFU Public Square who are managing the event, uh, and also, of course, the Sterling Prize Committee. The Sterling Lecture is a highlight of my year because it showcases one of the most important functions of a public university to explore controversial and difficult subjects in a way that prioritizes careful, thoughtful analysis. Uh, in this particular year, it seems to me even more important than ever that universities take responsibility for ensuring that this work continues and that we do not let intolerance, ideology, bigotry or intellectual laziness divert us from this mission. Before I introduce Tamara Star Blanket, I will just say a few words about how the event will be managed today. After Tamara's presentation, there will be a panel discussion with two invited guests, Professor Irene Watson and Dr. Sharon Venn, who will join us remotely on video. We'll then move to a question and answer period that I will be the moderator for, and we'll do our best to ensure that the questions uh, that come in cover a diversity of topics and represent different points of view. I do want to be clear on our community guidelines uh, in order to make the discussion safe and inclusive. Above all, there will be no tolerance for those who promote violence or intolerance against others on the basis of race, ethnicity, 
national origin, sexual orientation, gender identity, religious affiliation, or different ability. And secondly, don't assume that you know something about the speaker, such as their gender or the pronouns they use based on their name uh, or their image. I also want to say a brief word about the topic of today's presentation. Uh, the Sterling Lecture is always uh, about controversial topics, but today the topic can evoke very strong personal emotions. We want to be sure that anyone in our audience who is affected by the discussion has resources available if they need some help coping uh, with some of the topics that we're going to talk about. You'll find links to a list of resources and support services in the chat function on your right. If you do have questions, uh, we'll save those until after the talk, but please submit them at any time using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Please note your questions will not be displayed, but we will be receiving them and, and I will be directing them appropriately either to Tamara or to one of our panelists. Uh, and please let, let us know if your question is directed to uh, a specific person. So I'm now very pleased uh, to introduce Tamara Starblanket of the Atakakup Nation in Treaty 6 territory. Tamara teaches criminology at the Native Education College where she is also the Dean of Academics. She began her university education, I'm very pleased to say, at Simon Fraser University just over 20 years ago, earning a bachelor's degree in political science. She then moved to the study of law with an LLB from UBC and an LLM from University of Saskatchewan. Building on her thesis from Saskatchewan, she wrote an incisive analysis of Canada's treatment of Indigenous peoples with special focus on residential schools. For me, there are two features of Tamara's book, Suffer the Little Children, that particularly stand out. First, and, and I'll make it clear that I say this as a compliment, it is a deeply academic book. Tamara brings her incisive legal analysis to historic evidence and documents the logic of her arguments in great detail. Secondly, uh, her analysis uh, makes contentious arguments about the history and contemporary practices of the Canadian state. For many of us, her conclusions about this are deeply disturbing because we are all involved in electing and guiding our governments. And so we are all somewhat responsible for what she will be describing to her tonight. In recognition of this important work, and on behalf of Simon Fraser University and the Sterling Prize Committee, Ron and I would like to present Tamara Starblanket with the 2020 Nora and Ted Sterling Prize in support of controversy. I now invite Tamara Starblanket to present the Sterling Prize Lecture for 2020. Thank you, Tamara. I just want to uh, begin this evening's presentation by uh, giving thanks to our creation and our Mother Earth. And, uh, and I'll attempt to introduce myself in Cree. And Nia Utsapiki Sisqueo Mitsikasun, Tamara Starblanket Uma Nia Niwi Huwen. Hi, hi, Kinana Skumtin to the Great Spirit, our creation, and our Mother Earth. Hi, hi to the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish nations on whose lands we live and reside in, and the many original nations on our Great Turtle Island. Hi, hi to my late son. I want to honor and give all my respect and love to the many children and our people who passed on from the horror called the residential school and child welfare systems. And the people who physically survived but continue to suffer the immense trauma and sorrow from the long term effects of genocide. To the children who are still forcibly removed in the child welfare system today. And to my late family who are not here, my mom, my dad, sisters and brother, who passed on from the effects that I have outlined in the legal research. And finally, my late mother would have turned 69 today. October 29th um, is the day she was born, and it is her that I honor and love for giving me life. I am thankful to the Simon Fraser University and the Sterling Committee 
for awarding this year's Ted and Nora Sterling Prize in support of controversy to suffer the little children, genocide, indigenous nations in the Canadian state. Much thankfulness and respect to the Native Education College executive and administration for your support by allowing this special event at our beautiful longhouse this evening. A big thank you, hi hi Kinana Skumpton, to Sharon Ben and Irene Watson for agreeing to be on the panel and your most important work. Hi hi to Liana Paul for nominating the book. And to my family, my children, my mom and dad, Roberta and Lazar Whiskey Jack, and to my sister Jasmine for supporting me by being here this evening. And to my aunt and my uncle and the many friends and the friends that are here this evening. It is an immense honor to receive the Sterling Prize. And I also respectfully acknowledge Mr. and Mrs. Sterling's foresight for their unique endowment toward a prize on controversy. The fact that SFU holds such an award inspires me that there can be peace. Although I do not view this work as controversial, it is the truth. Our great Turtle Island and the original nations of this hemisphere and globally did not disappear despite colonial invasion and genocide and the attempts to render us invisible. The invasion began with the doctrine of discovery or what Lenape and Shawnee scholar Stephen Newcomb termed the doctrine of domination. By overrunning and claiming indigenous peoples and nations lands in what is a global campaign of domination and dehumanization. As you will likely guess, I do not view the issue of genocide as being controversial. According to the Oxford Dictionary, controversy is a disagreement on a matter of opinion and prolonged argument or dispute, especially when conducted publicly. Another definition that I found on Wikipedia, controversy is a state of prolonged public dispute or debate, usually concerning a conflicting opinion or point of view. In the context of genocide as a controversy, it is a narrative that conceals colonial destruction and the intent to destroy our nations. Controversy maintains the state, Canadian state's narrative and the society's role in the unabated forcible transferring of indigenous people's children into present times and the lands and territories it continues to occupy and claim. With no afterthought of the societies and nations that existed and continue to live on, on our great island with our original laws, our customs, our beliefs, our spirituality and cultures as old as the beginning of time itself. So it is necessary and timely to view the world from a standpoint that challenges the denial and dismantles the lies created by the fiction that the crown holds underlying title to our lands and territories and, and questions the immorality of the colonial project. Academic scholarship and institutions remain in denial and complacent about its role in the domination and dehumanization of indigenous nations and peoples. Instead of challenging racist concepts and ideas that maintain the status quo, the intelligentsia, or the academy continues to pass off myths of peace through reconciliation and the 94 calls to action, rather than examine its own complicity in the crime of genocide. In this vein, I appreciate the opportunity to discuss my work and suffer the little children. A question that I would like you to think about as we continue the presentation is the academy's complicity in genocide and what can be done differently from here on in and how we can begin to change the way that the discussion is framed in Canada and also globally around the world. So as Mr. Driver explained here, this, uh, this research that took seven long years is based on a master of laws. And two of the um, legal issues 
that I examine is whether the Canadian state is culpable for genocide and whether the state violates customary international laws on genocide. And that basically is taken looking at what is the legal meaning of the li limited definition of genocide in the Canadian Criminal Code. And as you, normally this presentation takes a long time to get through. It can take days actually, <laughs> because I teach it in, my, in, the, in the criminology program here. However, um, I will do my best to try to condense it into a short, brief presentation. And so some of the challenges that I would briefly want to mention that I encountered that I needed to think about when I was understanding, attempting to understand genocide, I guess the first one is that I needed to think of the future generations and the, the way that my arguments were drafted could not undermine or domesticate our issues to Canada. Um, and also another issue or challenge is words matter. The way the society frames issues as it pertains to Indigenous people is in a lot of rhetoric and euphemisms, especially when it comes to the residential school and the child welfare system. Another challenge was, is, or was, is cultural genocide and forced assimilation because cultural genocide was taken out of the Genocide Convention, I could not frame the legal issues in that manner. So I needed to reframe the destruction and the violence committed against Indigenous people's children. So, and Roland Christian, Sherry Young, and Michael Moran in the Circle Game talk about this as, uh, they, they call it rhetoric. Also, they refer to it as the word game. So very briefly, rhetoric is the art of effective or persuasive speaking or writing, especially the use of figures of speech and other compositional techniques. And a euphemism is a mild or indirect word or expression substituted for one considered to be too harsh or blunt when referring to something unpleasant or embarrassing. And that is the way that the residential school system in Canada, the way that the scholarship, the government, the way that everybody, including the TRC, describes the destruction that Indigenous children, our nations, experienced as a result of our children being forcibly transferred. The framework that I built my legal arguments around is the United Nations Convention for the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. So in the present convention, genocide means any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. By A, killing members of the group, B, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, C, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. D, imposing measures inten intended to prevent births within the group, and E, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. This was the legal framework that I built my legal arguments around. And so what is not mentioned in, in the video uh, is I put two components of this, of the, of the acts of genocide together. And it's basically article E and B, that the forcible transferring, forcible transferring, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group causes B, the serious and bodily or mental harm to members of the group. And in that way, when you look at those two um, articles, sections of the, of the convention, then you actually can begin to reframe what really went down in those institutions. And so I would like to uh, read a little bit from the book this evening because, you know, when we think about the denial, 
the long-standing denial um, that the society is in about um, the lands and territories that they reside in, that they live in. Um, when, they, when you think about the denial that I encountered uh, while I was writing this Master of Laws dissertation, um, the denial is so deep and it's deeply ingrained in this society that, um, that when I go to present to um, universities, I was in Montreal, um, SFU a few times, um, different universities, it doesn't matter where I go. When I ask the question to non-Indigenous people and whether, you know, um, how many of them have heard the standard myth that, that Indigenous people are drunk, are lazy, and are bums. And everybody in that room will put up their hand to, you know, and this happens everywhere and it happens consistently. And so that's what I mean when I talk about this denial that, you know, it's, to me, I find it deeply disturbing when you have a society that still debates whether it's racist especially when they have these deeply, deep-seated beliefs about indigenous peoples. That those earlier ideas of the savage and the barbarian and the pagan and all of those dehumanizing descriptors are now, you know, we're drunk and we're lazy and we're bums and those ideas never disappear or they never go away. And so I'm going to read to you a little bit of this model of domination and dehumanization. And it's, um, so I'll just proceed to read it. It's the dominating and dehumanizing laws and policies are implemented to demonize, isolate, and destroy original nations through a forced civilization indoctrination process, also known as laws of occupation. These laws serve as the cornerstone of the legalized persecution and oppression of indigenous nations in the colonizers' quest for land. Colonial domination justified by the dehumanizing Western doctrine of domination or racial superiority is vital to the process of genocide. The experience of genocide for indigenous nations is characterized in a model that explains the destructive framework of colonial invasion on a global scale. The model shows that colonialism and genocide are inextricably linked. Certain sectors of academic discourse and society have downplayed the destructive nature of colonialism and deny that genocide occurs in this process. It has been claimed that because indigenous children were not intended to be physically wiped out, genocide did not occur. Mundorf contends that as Colin Tatz put it, though the Genocide Convention does not account for grades or levels of genocide, for all of us, death is absolute. Serious bodily or mental harm is something else. Children forced into conversion may well become coerced Catholics, but they live. Tatz and even Mundorf appeared to promote the idea that whatever these programs affects, they were not constructed to kill individuals, an important distinction. However, the claim that serious and bodily and mental harm, which the UNGC itself defines in Article 2B as genocidal, is not as horrific as death reveals the inability of such, such scholarship to come to grips with the full devastation of the genocidal experience of Indigenous people's children, as we have attempted to make visible here. From a cognitive legal lens, does a claim of what is right from the perspective of the col colonial denier such as Tats who claims even though children suffered serious and bodily and mental harm, children forcibly indoctrinated and coerced into a Catholic worldview is not as, as horrific as death, make it true. Does it lessen the horror that children endeared at the hands of the state? Newcomb, Stephen Newcomb, building on Winter's cognitive legal theory, provides a powerful mechanism to challenge the genocide denial in this regard. Stephen Winter points out that the revolutionary findings of cognitive theory provide us with a refreshing new insight into the issues of meaning and autonomy in human affairs. Because of the history of US government, um, by the way, I can't um, do a quote unquote because there's too many quotes and unquote. So um, if you're interested, please just read. 
buy, please buy the book and read. Because of the history of US government, Canadian government officials imaginatively imposing their thoughts and ideas on our respective peoples in the name of law, we as Indian people have been socialized into the habit of thinking of non-Indian law as if it were a kind of an external physical force or authority that rules over us. He further holds by citing a quote from Adolf Hitler that one cannot rule by force alone. True force is decisive, but it is equally important to have the psychological something, which the animal trainer also needs to be master of his beast. They must be convinced that we are the victors." Unquote. The oppressive narrative of genocide denial that is deeply entrenched in the state and colonial society is a product of its colonial imagination. Newcomb continues, we as the indigenous nations and peoples have the ability to assume the cognitive and psychological position that the genocide denier is not the victor or even truthful. It might be claimed that our analysis here is a product of the indigenous imagination. However, the evidence of massive and widespread violence and terror that children endeared at, endeared at the hands of the state is not imaginary, but factual though the colonial imagination may have to be overcome to digest it. In this regard, Lemkin's framework on genocide had to do with state perpetrators of the crime, trying to disestablish that which holds a nation or people together collectively, linguistically, culturally, psychologically, and spiritually, with the objective of making the nation or people no longer exist. It seems that killing the Indian in the child or kill the Indian, save the man, in the US context, encapsulates the intention test for genocide, but it, because it provides a concise verbal formulation of the intention to destroy or kill that which holds the indigenous nations together as a cohesive whole. This does not have to only consist of physical death. McDonald's address to the House of Commons in 1883 supports the contention here that the goal was to ensure that Indian people no longer existed as national identities by being compelled to acquire the habits and modes and thought of white men. The methods used to coerce young people to speak, think and write like the white men exhibit massive patterns of violence and terror. The destruction brought against children throughout the history of the system was known by state officials, yet nothing was ever done to rectify or change the atrocious conditions that indigenous people's children were living under. Duncan Campbell Scott openly acknowledged that system-wide 50% of the children who passed through these schools did not live to benefit from the education which they had received therein. In spite of Bryce's medical report to the Department of Indian Affairs, no action was taken to address the atrocious conditions. Another aggra aggravating factor is the most recent reports of starvation experiments performed on indigenous children. Dr. Ian Mosby confirms the government knew that underfunding was the cause of the malnu malnutrition before the experiments were conducted. Another issue is specific intent. The state of Canada ensured that forced assimilation or cultural genocide measures were not recognized as a crime of genocide in international law. And this explains why the state invokes the loopholes it created when drafting the crime because of the awareness that the conduct it was engaging in would be genocide under international law. The state regards its genocidal conduct as cultural genocide as per the loophole in the treaty itself, resulting from the TRC final conclusions. The statement by the Canadian Civil Liberties Association to the Hate Propaganda Committee that the forcible removal of children would be genocide is instructive. The Hate Propaganda Committee, and therefore Canada, knew by the instruction from the Civil Liberties Association Given the attempted loopholes created by the omission of cultural genocide from the UNGC, the civilizing mandate was nonetheless accomplished contrary to Article 2B by the widespread and massive experience of the serious and bodily and mental harm against Indigenous people's children 
And how does the state account for this widespread atrocity? It was known throughout the history of the system that children underwent vicious acts of violence, starvation, forced labor conditions, and appalling death rates. Yet government inaction throughout the residential school system to address, to address it was a norm. Did the state of Canada, having been aware of what was happening and indeed it, its likely results, seek to rectify the problem or stop the system in its tracks or return the children back to loving families and communities and nations? No. Did the government do anything to rectify the destruction committed against innocent children? No. These facts certainly negate any argument that the intention behind the system was benevolent. Certainly having knowledge of the conditions and violence children were living under aggravates, not mitigates the specific intent requirement. It allowed the massive and systemic serious and bodily and mental harm to continue unabated. Another, Prime Minister Harper in his so-called apology downgrades a genocidal experience for Indigenous nations collectively. The experience is minimized as adding up to no more than tragic accounts of the emotional, physical, and sexual abuse and neglect of helpless children." Unquote. The use of a model challenges the genocide denial that occurs globally about Indigenous peoples and nations' experience of colonial invasion. The model employs the use of a metaphor to reveal the rhetorical and destructive nature of the colonial framework, exposing the residential school system as an intentional genocidal process. It will be shown that the effects of the residential school are in the child welfare, child welfare system and the forcible removals today. Now, this, I read this last night to my, to my sister and this took about 35 minutes to actually go through this section. I'm just going to read a little bit from the rest of it. So in the colonizing process, genocide takes place through three stages, demonization, isolation, and destruction of original nations or indigenous peoples and nations. All of these elements come together as the oppressor implements the two phases of genocide described by Raphael Lemkin. Figure one, and I'll just quickly briefly show the people watching that this is figure one. Displays the domination and dehumanization through a metaphor. The model describes the colonial body and the tools of this body or colonial society. Missing from this model is the body politic or colonizing body. The metaphor of the machine or engine is used to explain the process of genocide. For clarity, the use of the terms machine or engine metaphorically explains the process of indoctrination or the serious and bodily and mental harm that occurs as a result of the forced transfer. It explains the process indigenous nations have collectively undergone through the forcible transfer of their children from their own family, community, and nation to another group via residential institutions expressly intended to assimilate them into the colonial society. Clarification is necessary because genocide is a human decision. The use of the word machine is by no means an attempt to diminish the human decision of genocide. Human beings plan, create, and drive the machines they construct. The model explains not just the act, but the colonizing state of mind behind the act. The metaphor of the machine explains the residential school system as a dominating and dehumanizing process. The figure itself represents symbolically a washing machine, or more specifically, a brainwashing machine that explains the process of genocide. The term brainwashing is not meant to dehumanize or disrespect the experience of Indigenous people's children's collective terror and violence. It conveys the reality of the forced indoctrination through the serious and bodily and mental harm committed against the innocent. The process conditioned children to think and speak and write like the civilized society it was being transferred to through brutal methods. The model describes the violent methods of conditioning innocent children into viewing the world from a westernized Christian perspective. 
The work of Ward Churchill's Kill the Indian, Save the Man and Chris John Young and Morin's The Circle Game is utilized to explain how the forcible transferring of indigenous people's children causes collective serious and bodily and mental destruction. Churchill explains indigenous children were forced to see themselves through the eyes of the colonizer. Churchill juxtaposes photos of a young Cree named Thomas Moore as he appeared at the time of his arrival at the Virginia Indian Industrial School in 1910 and another of Moore as he appeared three years later. The cover photo of this book, Suffer the Little Children, shows children at the Holy Angels Boarding School in Fort Chipewyan praying to a recently arrived statue to the school. Easily misinterpreted as children engaged in humble prayer, the actuality it captures is their torturous religious indoctrination. And as you can see that, that's on the cover of the book. While such before and after imagery was frequently used by government propagandists as graphic evidence of the progress made by children committed to residential institutions, what it actually provides is stunningly powerful visual evidence of genocide's two phases. The deliberate and systematic destruction of the national pattern of the oppressed group and imposition of the national pattern of the oppressor. Insofar as children were forcibly dominated and dehumanized by torture, starvation, disease, forced labor, and sexual predatory acts, Churchill's analysis supports the brainwashing machine analogy by his accurate classification of the destruction committed against children. The young ones were unable to fit into either the colonial world or their societies and were forcibly indoctrinated with terror, self-loathing as successive generations of children transmitted the terror, trauma, confusion, sorrow, and debilitating social conditions. These are known as the long-term impacts of genocide. Children that physically survived the residential school system suffered both bodily and mental destruction. The young ones were individually and then collectively as nations indoctrinated by the methods utilized to kill the Indian and the child." Unquote. Again, the survivors witnessed their friends, brothers, sisters, family and people being tortured in many ways. The children were compelled to live under deplorable living and health conditions, which also led to death. This experience supports Zart's view that colonialism produces internalized violence and terror in the colonized. The long-term impacts were transmitted to several generations and the profundity of their destructive effect upon native people, both individually and collectively, not only in the immediacy of their operational existence, but in the aftermath as well, was and remains by any reasonable estimation incalculable. Chris John's explanation of the total institution supports the metaphor of the machine that forcibly conditions a child to think and speak and write. The authors demonstrate the process of being taken apart and reassembled into the intended vision of the government. In the name of efficiency, total institutions unmake the people over whom they gain control. It matters little how old an inmate is when he or she is placed under the institution's thumb. Whoever that person is and how he or she defends it and asserts it must be taken apart and reassembled enough to allow what remains to operate in accordance with the institutional requirements. They further add that by doing this, the total institution does not produce a new self, but no self at all. The total institution dehumanizes the child. The Canadian Oxford Dictionary defines engine as a thing that is an agent or instrument of a desired end or achievement. And recall that dehumanize is defined as deprive of human characteristics or make them personal or machine-like. The process despirits the children by making them severely traumatized. Consider this further definition of engine as a machine or especially a contrivance used in torture. The oppressor employs the tools, machinery or engine to produce the desired result and that absorbs indigenous children into the body politic. The metaphor of the colonial body or artificial man explains the state 
Newcomb writes about this colonial body as a collective body composed of individual humans interacting in their social and cultural lives arrives to a new continent with a colonizing ravenous hunger and desire for land. From an indigenous perspective, this collective colonizing body can be metaphorically thought of as a predator that pursues its indigenous spoil and prey. It sets out to catch, devour, and consume everything in sight. And this correlates with the common expression, this is a consumer society and we're in the belly of the beast. He demonstrates that colonization is a metaphor for eating through the conception of the image of an empire, state, or commonwealth as a collective body or metaphorical person. The colonizing body engages in the process of seizing, eating, and swallowing indigenous lands. In this sense, colonization can be understood metaphorically as a process of digestion or assimilation. According to Newcomb, the imagery makes sense of US policies to assimilate Indians into the social and political body of the United States and Canada. Churchill, in the same vein, the weight of the policy in the US and Canada alike have been placed on assimilating, digesting might be a better word, the residue of survivors. The, the colonial body is a predator that pursues its indigenous spoiler prey. The predator swallows, engulfs, devours, it consumes original nations and their lands into its colonizing body politic. And to reiterate, Duncan Campbell Scott openly declared that, quote, our objective is to continue until there is not a single Indian in Canada that has not been absorbed into the body politic, unquote. The state policy and law in, of the same colonizing body from the US side was said in the words of Theodore Roosevelt, to be a mighty pulverizing engine to break up the tribal mass. The metaphor is seen as a pulverizing engine conveying the prey are being prepared for consumption into the colonial body. So through this, the national identities of indigenous children are consumed by all the violence that they encountered in the residential institutions. As I'm running out of time to, to complete this, what I'd like you to consider as we, you know, as, uh, as what I just read to you, that there, there is more to this. And, and what, what, what I presented to you is just, you know, there's like 200 and some, 100 and some pages before that of actually um, unpacking colonialism and genocide. And, and the reason that this metaphor was created was to get past the genocide denial that exists in this society. The genocide denial that I encountered by, by my committee, the genocide denial that exists on a bus, the genocide denial that exists in the universities, that, ex that exists everywhere. And, and very briefly, I know I only have a few minutes left, but the legal arguments that, um, you know, well, first of all, the, the, the um, international jurisprudence from uh, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda and the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, that there's case law in there that establishes that you can't always get into the minds of every single perpetrator of genocide, it's impossible. But if you can show patterns of same conduct um, and that if it's massive and widespread, then you can show the intent, the specific intent. Um, and certainly, when you look at what happened across um, Canada, well, uh, everywhere, really, um, you can see that massively children were tortured, they were sexually preyed on, they were forcibly starved, they died by, death, uh, by dilapidated living conditions and health conditions, and so on. And the problem that I have is that this society does not not seem to be able to want to come to grips with that destruction that went on and that still goes on in the current child welfare system. You know, Canada was supposed to be transparent and open about its intention to circumvent the United Nations Convention on Genocide. And the, the, Canada did this. Um, it's extensively documented in the book. I don't, I don't need to go into all of it, 
but um, what, what the research shows is that Canada, that cultural genocide was the only point that Canada vehemently disagreed with, that they were threatening a reservation if it stayed in the Genocide Convention. Because, and the United Kingdom was also um, a part of that discussion, because the United Kingdom colonized all over Mother Earth. And the same process of colonial destruction that I just described occurred in other parts of Mother Earth. And so, you know, if Canada was to be transparent, according to Article 18 of the Vienna Convention on Treaties, um, well, Canada has not been transparent. And it's, it, and it's amply demonstrated in, in this book that Canada um, continues to impose its laws, its policies, uh, uh, policies such as land claims, and it continues with the goal that it began with when it first colonized and invaded in our lands and our territories, which is basically to assimilate us into the Canadian state. And, but what happened with this work is that it just reframed it for everybody. It reframed it so that people, so the light, the truth can come out into the light for the world to see about what has happened to my people, to our original nations on this continent. And I don't know what else to say to that. There's more I could say, but I encourage everybody, if you have, you know, if there's anything I didn't go over this, you can read it in the book. Um, again, I'm very honored to have received this award, Mr. Driver and, and Ron. I'm, uh, I encourage the universities and SFU, you're leading the way. Thank you. Hi, hi, Kenan Askumpton. You're, you're leading the way you're, you're, um, by, by acknowledging this, this research. And I challenge and, and like I said, think about um, your complicity in genocide because when we think like that, then we can actually begin to get to the root of the, what the real problems are here. Well, there's more to it than that, but I think it's complicity in genocide. And what part did, did you play, for example? Um, so I've, I'll conclude with that. I, um, again, I want to thank everybody, my family and my friends, and um, the panelists that will be speaking shortly. Um, I can't think of anything else. The college, Native Education College, thank you very much for allowing this event to be held here this evening. Hi, hi, Kirina Skumpton. That was uh, an eloquent presentation, and I hope that everybody will take the opportunity to read tomorrow's book and to think about it. As I said at the start, it is a, uh, a very strong analysis, and, and that is one of the things that is most impressive about it. But I think you can also tell it is a book that is also very disturbing uh, for all of us who have come here as immigrants, and it is a book that we all need to read. And I, I, I thank you for your comments about the university. I know we have a lot more to do. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased now to welcome two distinguished panelists that have been uh, invited to give their thoughts on the, uh, both on the presentation uh, and the issues uh, that it raises. Uh, and I, I will briefly introduce them and I will hope that the technology is going to get us uh, everybody virtually in the same room. Um, our first guest is Professor Irene Watson, who is the Pro Vice Chancellor for Aboriginal Leadership and Strategy and a Professor of Law at the University of South Australia. She is a member of the Tangankakalt, uh, Mayantank, and Boandic Aboriginal nations situated in an area of uh, Southeast South Australia uh, known as the Coorong 
and she has written extensively about indigenous people and the law. Our second panelist is Dr. Sharon Venn, uh, who is Notokwe Muskwa Manitokan, and an expert on and who has written extensively and lectured uh, extensively about indigenous rights. She is a legal scholar and practitioner who has worked at the United Nations and was involved in the writing of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, where she also worked on the UN study of treaties. So I, I now invite um, Tamara uh, and, our, and our two guests to uh, engage, perhaps engage in a conversation, but perhaps start by uh, reflecting uh, on what you have heard tonight. And um, I will join Tamara at a safe distance. Uh, and after the, the panelists have spoken, we'll, uh, we'll move to questions and, and responses. Thank you. So perhaps I should invite one of our panelists to speak first. Perhaps um, Professor Watson, as you are the furthest away, perhaps you, you would like to start with some opening remarks. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, just after 10 here. Uh, I'm in Adelaide, South Australia. So greetings from the South to all of you in the North in these most troubling times of, um, I was just talking earlier about the weather and our experiences of very, very strange weather and, and, and the climate change that we're, we're all um, um, experiencing across the planet and, and the, uh, the impact that that has on, um, as joining in my thinking here uh, with Tamara's presentation, it's not just about the human, this question of genocide is, is we, we and as it's been framed by Western, um, uh, by the West, and, and and taken up by the academies as a a concern of the human, but it's a much bigger. And and as again, you know, I appreciate um, Tamara's presentation. It's a it's a much bigger story than just the human. So I bring that and um, share share with the North. Um, um, all, all of our concerns that we have for both the human and all our um, relations in the natural world. And that this particular presentation and this focus and the questions that Tamara's work presents and poses deals with all of that um, beyond the human and um, to address uh, uh, many, many, of the, um, many of the concerns that we all share. But I, um, so I'm, I, I'm also very honoured to be invited to participate in this forum. Thank you very much. It's, um, it's a great honour. I just, uh, in, in thinking, uh, in, in the way that this, the acknowledgements began and the welcome, the, the welcoming um, by our elder into these discussions, but the, the question posed um, or presented um, by the university, the, the idea of unceded lands, I'm, I'm glad that, that that kind of truth is being spoken. And when, when we think about unceded lands, what unceded lands therefore means that the land that you're occupying is a stolen land. The question that follows from an occupation by peoples of a stolen land is the question that we never, never get to, and that is by what lawful authority do you take our lands? Do you take Aboriginal people's lands from across the globe? Um, so I'm, I'm very heartened that this is a conversation that, that um, really breaks down even the notion of controversy, because for us, it's, uh, uh, our lives are controversial simply because of the fact that we exist. Um, so it's, it's about a truth, you know, and, and speaking our truths. And so those questions, uh, I know for, for, for myself and many Aboriginal peoples, to ask that question, by what lawful authority do you take our lands, is, um, is, is a critical question that often um, we're not positioned to be able to ask with great clarity and, and, and great truth. And um, very rarely do we hear a response from the international community or the colonial states themselves. So 
in asking those critical questions, the answer cannot always be that it has been legitimised by a genocidal process. Because to, to enable and to allow that colonial project to continue and that kind of logic is to enable the genocidal process itself to continue um, as it is now, particularly when, as uh, in, in Tamara's work and in much of the work that is, has been done in Australia, in the, uh, across the Australian continent, the facts, the historical facts, the history of the colonial project, the facts that have, have been brought before um, the High Court itself in the, in the Commonwealth decision of Kruger, where we have, you know, the High Court justices acknowledging that the fact of removal, the, 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 the fact of um, the destruction of Aboriginal societies um, may constitute genocide, but in their legal opinion, it's um, um, we, we get caught up in the word game of 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 uh, doesn't clearly constitute intent, and much of this is 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 woven through Tamara's argument, the word games, and and what um, the processes of genocide, the legal processes of genocide, and how. Um, how that process itself, in my view, itself constitutes an ongoing colonialism, but an ongoing colonial violence, the very denial, the very denial of the truth and the facts that have been well documented um, and have been taken up by the High Court in Australia, by many courts in a, across Canada, but yet denied um, and through a process of playing word games. So we, we can't um, enable that to continue, that the process of genocide itself becomes an enabler for the theft of Aboriginal people's land. And in doing that, enabling that, of, of not stripping back and deconstructing and decolonizing and coming to a place of the bare truth of, of um, the occupation and the theft of Aboriginal people's lands, we, we enable the truth to, to, to not surface, to not be heard. So clearly um, it, it's heartening that, 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 this, that your university has awarded this prize and this opportunity to Tamara. It's one space that opens up where the truth can be heard and the challenge um, the, the, the challenge that that poses to the academy. But in challenging the academy, it raises many obligations for all of us. We're all obligated to the truth when, when, when the truth is, is rewarded by a prize such as this. So it sits squarely in, in the space we're talking here now within, within the academy, not just this, your academy, Simon Fraser University, but all academies in terms of um, what is, what, it, what is this education process into the future and to what extent will Aboriginal education, Aboriginal epistemologies uh, live and breathe? And, uh, and the notion when we're talking about genocide of um, the, the importance of Aboriginal epistemologies, um, will, we, will we breathe life into that or will, will the academy and other institutions also be a part of the genocidal process and that we have an epistemocide, you know, the death of Aboriginal knowledges. So genocide has, has meant many faces when we start opening it up and looking at it from an Aboriginal standpoint. You know, as I said, the land, um, the, the, um, the land, um, our laws, um, will we have, um, will we continue to, um, to occupy a space where we can live and breathe our own legal and cultural institutions, or will we continue along this course of a, of a juricide, for example, or an ecocide of our land? So the question and this debate around genocide um, opens up the opportunity to, to, um, to discuss, to think about, and to change the world for the betterment of, um, of future generations to a space where, um, um, they have greater safety uh, in the knowledge that their um, that, that that a truth will prevail. That's um, uh, that's uh, I'd, 
I, I think I'll pause there and let someone else speak for a minute. Thank you very much, Professor Watson. I, I'll now go to, um, to Dr. Venn and, and ask um, her for, for some comments as well. Dr. Venn. Um, hi, hi. Nia Nautico must comment on that. They also must got all them. Um, my Cree name is Oberlin Bear City next to the crater. And I'm from the Thunderbird Bear Clan. And this is, this is something that a lot of our own people do not know. Our clans don't know the responsibilities and obligations uh, that associate with our, with our own legal system. And that's, you know, what you have to, Kamara has to be commended for, uh, to work that she did on, on bringing uh, this issue to the front. And I know, you know, firsthand how hard that was for her to write that book or to write the thesis, actually, even to get it through the university. Um, there was a lot of resistance in the university uh, to her writing, writing the, the materials. Uh, it was not considered, quote unquote, a, a legitimate uh, avenue of expo exploration for an academic uh, endeavor. So they, you know, discouraged her and uh, put up every conceivable uh, academic roadblock that they could conceivably think about and uh, try to try to uh, push it off and not have it done. And so, you know, the tenacity of her to continue going, uh, which, which has to be commended. And I'm, I'm very happy that uh, the university and, the, and Sterling's have recognized, um, yes, it might be, you know, controversial, but it still needs to be said. And um, that, you know, as Irene has just said, you know, the truth has to be told. And um, if we don't tell the truth, uh, <clears throat> when we go back to the creation, we cannot go there with a, with a lie on our breath. So we have to tell the truth. And uh, that's, that's what uh, this is all about. And the, the thing about this, this issue of genocide in Canada, in the imagined state of Canada, imagined only in the colonizer's mind, it's like Australia is imagined only in the colonizer's mind. It doesn't exist in our reality. And Canada doesn't exist in, in my reality. Um, I live on Great Turtle Island. You know, the colonizers have renamed it. Uh, I don't accept it. Uh, I don't accept Canada. I don't accept the United States. I don't. So who are these people, you know, to come in, into our territory and rename it? Anyway, that's, that's, you know, that's, that's what, you know, the wiping out of the memory of our nations is, is, is part of the genocide. Because if you look at the genocide convention, uh, it says cause serious bodily or mental harm to a group. Well, the mental harm of, of being told that you don't belong to a territory that you, that your ancestors have always lived in, um, you know, we didn't come from anywhere. You know, this whole stupid Thomas Jefferson thing about us coming across the Bering Strait is just, you know, pure rubbish. Um, and, and so they try to promote that, you know, issue about, you know, uh, as to a way to dispossess us. And I think that, you know, the academic uh, institutions need to sit back and really think about what they're doing. If they're really seriously thinking about uh, talking about and confronting these issues, they have to look at the way that they, they approach the learning issues of, of trying to work and write in these areas. Like if you have to follow the formulas that have been preconceived by somebody living someplace else, um, uh, like in England where they use uh, people that, you know, that they said was the big, you know, person who the, the philosopher of all time, John Locke, and you find out that he had shares in a slave trading company, that he had shares in, you know, the Virginia land company, and, you know, he had a vested interest in doing what he was doing. Uh, you know, how can you seriously teach that stuff in an institution? Or like what they've done with John A. MacDonald and his, you know, racist genocidal ideas, um, you know, that those kinds of things. How come all those professors that were writing history books on John A. MacDonald supposedly academic books, never mentioned the fact that he had these ideas about uh, residential schools and indigenous peoples um, and just choose, chose to ignore them and thereby you know, created a myth uh, of this so-called imagined state of Canada. And this is the kinds of stuff that Tamara has exposed in her book. 
because it was because of those kinds of uh, deficiencies of previous so-called scholars working in these areas and their, tr their decision not to include that has, you know, now when we come along and try to correct the record, people, you know, say, well, this is a controversial thing to do. Uh, no, it's not controversial. It's telling the truth, you know, and I think the more and more people that move into our territories, they have to know the truth because what they're doing is they're still trying to dispossess us and not, not many people across the country rose up against Canada's passage of that child welfare legislation last year. Nobody said hardly anything when it came into effect on January the 1st this year. People should have been in the streets saying that this is a continuation of the genocidal practices of the state. There was an absolute deafening sound across the country. So it rose to us, and I'm talking about, I'm talking about the royal we, the Crees, along with our, our relatives, the Sutina people, to file a complaint at the UN, the United Nations in Geneva on the Convention on the Rights of the Child, that Canada is violating our rights because they're still forcibly transferring our children out of our homes into non-Indigenous homes. They're still continuing that process. That's genocide. And nobody's supporting us when we say that. Instead, they're saying, oh, good for Canada, good for baby Trudeau for, you know, for, for promoting that. Take a look at that. Think about it because it's very serious what's going on. And why do we have to be complaining at the United Nations about actions of the state? You know, it's the same reason the way that Canada chose to construct how they put in the criminal code, the sections on genocide. You know, they only took out two of the components and said, you know, uh, killing members of the group or deliberately infecting on a group conditions of life calculated to bring about physical destruction. What about the rest of the what about the rest of the genocide convention? You know, when the United States tr tried to make reservations on the genocide convention, the International Court of Justice said you can't do that because if you do that, then you're then you're asking for permission to commit acts of genocide. And yet Canada did that in the criminal code, and nobody nobody said anything to Canada about that, and nobody in Canada said anything about the state. Like, why don't they amend the criminal code and include the whole section? Um, because they know darn well that if they did, they would, they would be completely in, in, je in jeopardy for, for violating the Genocide Convention. Because it says in the Genocide Convention on Article 4, uh, uh, constitutionally responsible rulers, public officials, or private individuals can be, can be held accountable for acts of genocide. That's in the Convention. But that's not in the Criminal Code of Canada because the Criminal Code of Canada only says with the, with, cannot be instituted without the consent of the Attorney General of Canada. Who, who gave the Attorney General of Canada that authority under, under the Genocide Convention? Nobody, because that's a public official that, that could make those decisions. So I think there's still a lot of work that has to be done. I'm not Tamara has to write her PhD on this and carry on, you know, and, and exposing all these kinds of things. But there's still, you know, there's these things are still going on every day. You know, like you hear what's going on in Australia, you hear what's going on in Aotearoa, you hear what's going on in Hawaii or in, in Southern Central America, like with the Makuchis and the, and the Yanomami and the Kuna and all these people where people, their children are being, are being targeted or what Trump did to the children along the border. Like these are genocidal acts that are going on today. And people are not doing anything because they think, oh, well, it's just indigenous people. Like, you know, just forget about them. They're disposable. And that's what happened, you know, with the residential schools. Because every place that there was a residential school, all those little towns and villages that were near those residential schools benefited from those residential schools because they got supplies from those towns. They, the children may not have eaten well, but let me tell you that the nuns and the priests stayed very well in those schools. You know, so uh, I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done and it's ongoing work uh, because these these truths have to be told and whether or not uh, people like it or not, this is the reality that we have lived with all these years and all the people that have gone before us have had to take this with them. And so we need to we need to speak up for them uh, and for the future too. The, this, is, this goes both ways back and forward. And we have we're sitting watching seven generations before us and seven generations ahead of us. So that's, you know, that's really what Tamara has exposed here in, in her book 
And I commend everybody to go out and get a copy. Um, buy a copy of the book. Uh, get tomorrow to, to you know to uh, autograph it, uh, and then go home and read it. Uh, I think that's really important. I don't know if they have copies of it there, but they should. Uh, I know socially distance and all that stuff, you know, but uh, read the book. So thanks for inviting me to comment. Thank you very much, Dr. Van. Um, I have a piece of technology here with questions showing up on it. And first from uh, Michaela Maguire, and she says to Tamara, uh, your work inspires me as a student and, in, and as an instructor. I agree that truth telling is not in any way controversial or radical. Thank you for telling the truth in your book and putting it together so eloquently. And then we get to the question, as an instructor and a researcher, how do you navigate resistance from students, colleagues, and the public to learning the truth? Um, you know, I think if you take the time to explain it to them, they will, they will be open to it. And, and, but of course, there's obviously going to be, to be people that will resist it. Um, you know, um, but I feel that if the institution is behind an instructor that is teaching that material, then there should be no problem. Um, but yes, I think I just tell it like it is. That's the only way you can, you can get around it. I mean, you can't, you can't sugarcoat you know, the, the horror. You, you can't um, use different words to explain it. You know, I think, I think the sooner that people understand and can be told about what really happened, then I think that we can begin to create some understanding or awareness about this, that, that they too are complicit in it. And then I guess maybe my answer to her would be bring it back to complicity in genocide. As, as um, Sharon mentioned, that there is a section in the Genocide Convention that talks about the complicity, the private, um, the who, who can be complicit in it. So yeah, I hope that answers her question, yeah. And also uh, turn to our panelists because I, I know you both have taught and you, you both make many um, public presentations. And, and could you reflect a little bit on the, firstly, the resistance you hear from, from people in an audience? And, and secondly, how, how, do you, how do you cope with that? Uh, how, do, how do you respond to the resistance? Uh, there's a lot of resistance, actually. And I find that the resistance is largely from the academic community and a number of um, experts who call themselves experts in genocide studies. Uh, and that's largely been problematic for, for my work because of the way the... Um, discourse, the disciplinary discourse around genocide studies has also been largely complicit in the exclusion, the exclusion of the, the, the special position of Aboriginal peoples and, and, and the fact of the, 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 the fact of genocide and the way it, it has, um, um, has occurred uh, across Aboriginal communities. I'm much more aware of what, what um, has occurred in Australia in terms of um, being on the ground and seeing it for myself. In fact, I can cite a, an example right here, right now, very relevant to the COVID scenarios. Uh, uh, I was talking earlier to the, um, the tech group who was setting up the panel about how things are going in Australia. Well, um, in terms of Aboriginal communities, many of our communities are, are doing okay because they're, they're, they're self-determining and they're um, protecting themselves. However, we, we have a, um, a situation in, um, in one of the states, in one of the juvenile detention institutions, which is always, if you look at the statistics of Aboriginal children uh, locked up in custody, always the majority of children in lockup are always Aboriginal. And um, we had an outbreak of COVID in one of the juvenile detention centres. So what do we call that? You know, if we could, and, and it takes us back to the point that uh, um, 
Tamara raised around the word games. And the word games are largely, uh, uh, um, are complicitly led by a number of scholars who call themselves experts in genocide studies. And I find that problematic. And, you know, we've already indicated that unpacking, decolonizing the colonial project is a lot of work. You know, we've been, our whole lives have been um, taken up with, uh, with, with the project of deconstructing the project itself, simply to find, um, to find our own Aboriginal meaning. For example, the, the name Tanganakaud, Miantank, Bungandich peoples are uh, three different nation groups that I'm related to, and I'm related to so many different nation groups because of the level of the genocide that occurred on our territories and the extent to which our peoples were rounded up and the small numbers who were left were rounded up and placed on missions. And the, um, some of the fiercest resistance to colonization came from the Tanganyika peoples. And as a result of that, that name of the Tanganyika um, was, was being buried and reconstructed as, a, as another name, as another nation group. And it's only just now, you know, all these years later, that, um, that a project around Tanganyika language is, is, um, is being, uh, um, being brought back to life because there were so few people who, who held that memory. And that's a genocide. Um, so that's the, the extent of how, the, the, how hard the work is to do. It's hard work because there's so much to do. And so when we encounter um, uh, an uh, all-powerful academies that are also complicit in this discourse of excluding the um, situation of Aboriginal peoples and reconstructing it be, of being outside genocide, so as to, as Sharon averted to, so as to ensure that the colonial states are not going to be positioned to have to come up with a mechanism and a remedy and a redress to um, um, uh, correct and, and, and decolonize this injustice is, um, is, is the most problematic piece that, that I find in my work of having to address. Not so much the students, um, you know, there is resistance from students as well, but the biggest problem is, is our other colleagues. Great. Thank you, Professor Watson. Um, maybe I could uh, turn to Dr. Ben now as well for, for comments on, on, on those issues. Um, I, I, you know, I agree with, with what Professor Watson and, 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 and um, Professor Starblanket have said about about these issues that I, I, I think the biggest resistance to discussion of genocide is, is from within the academic community. And I have had a, a, a few uh, <clears throat> close encounters, let's put it that way, uh, with people who supposedly work on the issues of genocide. Um, the ones in Europe are a bit more open to discussing this. Um, the, uh, the colonizer, People colonized from Canada, United States, Australia, New Zealand, who are working in this area, they don't want to talk about it. Uh, nope, not happening. Didn't happen somewhere else. Not here. You know, it's a very uh, ingrained uh, resistance on their part because then they have to examine what they're doing and they don't want to do that. They'd rather look at it somewhere else, but not in their own backyard. So that's why we have to keep going, continue pushing it. Great, I don't know if Professor Watson agrees with me or not, but that's how I see it. I will let you know there's a comment saying, I wish we could all applaud the, um, the, the speech in person. So that, that's a nice comment, came in from Anonymous. And um, a number of comments thanking Tamara for sharing her thoughts and, and summarizing her book tonight. So um, that, is, that is great. And another comment that, that actually reflects, I think, something that uh, uh, Dr. Venn said, which is um, the book really should have been a PhD thesis, not a master's thesis. So, um, and is there a way to give you a PhD for this? So, uh, wonderful, wonderful comments coming in from our audience. Um, here's a difficult question from Jacqueline Sinclair. Uh, I'm, I'm part of a small EDI++ working group at 
Simon Fraser University in the Lifelong Learning Department. And we are determined to encourage action, awareness, and learning. Uh, how can we ensure that learning and talk translate into action? And, and what would you, uh, Tamara, and the panelists like to see? I think that's a, a great question. How do we move from the academic to, to action? Um, let me, I can take a stab at that question. <laughs> so I think it comes down again to complicity and genocide because I feel that um, there's too many institutions, uh, post-secondary institutions right now talking about indigenization. So to me, that is more about the same old genocide. It's like appropriating our culture, cultures, um, our knowledge, um, and really um, fluffy talk around reconciliation, which reconciliation is a fluffy word too, right? And, and um, but uh, I feel that if studies, curriculum, education can be designed around looking at complicity and genocide, then I think we can start to move into action. Um, I believe that if people understand, because there are so many people, non-Indigenous people, that are not, that are not aware of what, what happened and, and the crimes against our nations, our, our people's children, and I believe that if people understood it properly in its proper context, you know, that curriculum, uh, education, um, studies can be designed around, um, you know, looking at complicity and genocide studies. I don't know. I mean, I think, I think as, as for action, I think that's, that's getting into action. That's, that's going, that's challenging some of the very important issues brought up by Sharon and Irene this evening too as well, and how, how the gatekeepers, the academic gate, gatekeepers um, uh, keep this, you know, try to keep the truth or the understanding of what really happened at bay. And that if, if you know, for example, Simon Fraser University or wherever else, if they decide to develop programs of Complicity, I don't know. I don't know what else you would call it. Complicity in genocide studies? I don't know. <laughs> that, yeah, I think, I think it would, and, and properly create curriculum that conveys that understanding. I think, and then you would actually see people, there wouldn't be so much ignorance out there that people would understand. They would actually begin to see that they've contributed to this idea, this dehumanizing idea or ideology or whatever it is that we're less than human. That, that, you know, they don't realize that when they engage in that kind of thought process that they're dehumanizing themselves, you know, and, and, and so it kind of leads to, I guess I'll conclude with, um, there's a really, there's such an important discussion by Roland Christon, Sherry Young, and Michael Morin in the Circle Game, and they talk about the residential school syndrome, that the real residential school syndrome is really about the people that created these institutions that through their policies and laws, they put these programs of genocide into place, that, they're, that the sick people are the ones that design them. That, so, so I think um, in a way, yeah, sort of, I think we can be creative in how we, how we can get into action. There's, you know, like I, I was always told to, I learned, have to learn how to think for myself. So part of it would be learning how to think for themselves too on how to get into action, so. Maybe we could start with Dr. Ben this time. Do you have uh, any suggestions for, um, for our questioner as to once you get to the, beyond the learning stage, once, you, once you've learned about the issues, then, then what? What, what? What can people do? And I, and I'm, I think here we're, we're mainly talking about people who are not Indigenous. People say they want to learn about, about what's going on. Um, and, but, you know, what are they learning? I, like, look at what's going on now across the country. Look at the Mi'kmaq people who are going through now. What you know, with the uh, resistance to the the fishing, uh, or the people in the Mohawk, the Mohawk of Caledonia, and and the government using its legal system against them, or 
what the government did against, you know, Chief Omniac and the Lubicon uh, or, you know, the Wisconsin people and you know, the Haida people. I mean, there's examples or, you know, like uh, what's happening with the boil water advisories in, in our territories. All these things, you know, are acts that are designed to get us to be removed from our territories and, and so that the territories become vacant so that people can move in. And when indigenous people say, look at, we, you know, we have these rights to, you know, to fish or to hunt or to, to live here, to be here. Um, you know, the, the, the colonizers get really bent out of shape, you know, and, um, and look at the violence that's being directed at, at, at indigenous peoples in, in, this, in, in this country. Um, and not, not, not counting about what, what violence is against indigenous peoples all over the world, like what, what the, what's going on with the Mapuches in Chile and, you know, what's going on with the Amazon people. Like, these acts are, are carrying on and people, you know, think it's isolated. It's got nothing to do with them. But, you know, it all has to do with everything because the whole of the creation is, is one entity. And if you're destroying the, the, the creation, you are destroying yourselves. And so everybody should is, 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 has to be involved in that. Um, and so you can't sit home and say, oh, you know, like it's got nothing to do with me. It's happening over there somewhere else. Um, and, and we just, we just, that has to stop because that colonization has brought that idea into the world that individuals have more rights than the collective. And this is a very dangerous uh, road for everybody to be on. Um, it's actually a dead end road if anybody's looking. Uh, so we need to really, you know, say, you know, not only do you need to learn about it, you need to be engaged. And in, in Alberta, they, they now don't want to, they don't probably want to teach that there was residential schools because that might be too uh, scary for young people who are in school. What about the, what about indigenous children who were in those residential schools for a hundred and some years? Wasn't it scary for them? Um, so, you know, like, uh, you know, we have to be careful about, you know, what do they call those, what do they call those people? The fluff balls, the snowballs, the somebody's, you know, overly coddled child. Uh, I don't know what they call them. Helicopter parents watching over their snowballs. I'm not sure what they, but you know, this, this has got to stop because otherwise they're never going to learn responsibilities and obligations. Um, uh, and we, and that has to be done. Look, look at what's happening now. It's, it's terrible. And uh, so you, we have to just keep going and keep talking about it. I, I, I don't have, uh, you know, I, I don't teach anymore at universities, but I, I, I still try to talk to students when I can about their own responsibilities, not just getting an A in the exam or whatever, what they're doing, but uh, trying to promote uh, what's going on. And I'll just give you an example. I don't know how much time we have, but there's a young, there was a woman at the University of Alberta. She, she's now left the University of Alberta. She wrote, she was writing a doctoral thesis in, in education. And she wrote a thesis about, and the first 67 pages of the thesis was about her, on her, what happened to her before she left the creation to come to Turtle Island. And the university decided that this was fantasy and that it didn't form a component of her thesis. And they wanted her to remove that from the thesis. Uh, you know, that just just undermined and destroyed uh, her re her relationship with her creator. And and who are they to say that to her? But they did, and so she left. So the academy is now um, devoid of that information because she took it with her. And so the, the understanding that could have had there is gone. Because the academy was too narrow-minded and, and too uh, focused somewhere else to recognize what she was saying. And these are things happening all the time with our people in the academy. So rather than promoting and pr pressing forward with it, they just step away. And I think that the academy has to be able to, to be able to see that there's some valuable components that could be brought to the academy that could make things better for everybody. But because of their inability to see beyond that, they, they push them away, you know, and, you know, for seven years, Tamara could have been pushed away and out of the, out there, I think on many occasions, 
she told me that's it. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm, I'm you know, forget about it. I'm just walking away uh, because it, you know, it was a struggle. I mean, honestly, it was because she's, she knew what she was doing, which is evidence in the book, but having to, you know, battle within the Academy to say, Hey, this is, this is valuable. Um, was really, you know, a really, you know, a, a lesson and that people should, learn from that but why did she have to do it for seven years you know most masters of laws take a year and a half two years at the max you know uh if three if you're really you know doing other things that don't have time to write but you know like seven years for goodness sakes that's that's ridiculous but that's what happened to her and i think that's where the people need to step back and really think how can we really assist uh in in, in expanding the ability of our peoples to write and do things that are come from an indigenous perspective, from an indigenous mindset. Um, when I was teaching at, at the law school, I used to tell my students, in this class, you're gonna do something interesting. You're gonna take that gift the creator gave you, it's called a mind. And we're gonna take that mind, we're gonna go for a walk, we're gonna go for a run, we're gonna take it around the block, we're gonna make it work. Because that's what law school, or that's what university should be to expand the mind and to be able to make things uh, available to everybody. But most universities are too afraid to do that. And I think that needs to be really uh, looked at um, because it's really doing a disservice to everybody. I'll just turn to uh, Professor Watson for some thoughts on moving from words to action. Uh, look, I think, um all that Tamara said is is uh, is full of great wisdom in terms of think, thinking about the complicity of genocide and how how you can embed that as a process within the academy um, uh, and move away from I agree from 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 the fluffy words and the fluffy processes like um, what we currently have in Australia of reconciliation. Um, as a process of engagement across the higher education sector. Uh, it's, it, it's a travesty and a sham that that's all we have. That's the only mechanism that we have to interact in that space, to have a conversation. And it needs to be much more than thinking about it being an add-on that we just indigenize and, and, and we add it on here, here and there and, and, and colour it up with with um, Aboriginality. It has to be much more deeper and a deeper thinking process than that. And uh, it, it involves the processes in thinking about what does decolonization of this space really mean? Um, so with that, we need tr true studies in decolonization that are um, fully engaged with, with community and elders and all of the First Nations peoples of the land, of, of the places where these universities and academies are located upon. And, um, and, and, and just to ditto all, all of what Sharon has, um, has said, it's, uh, we, we need to have a decolonization process that we determine and that we have a, 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 um, a powerful voice, not just simply a, a voice, an advisory, a marginal voice, but a powerful voice in reconstructing um, much of, um, of, of who we are because there's been so much of, of, of um, Aboriginal ways of being that have been completely um, colonised and, and deconstructed, and we need to reconstruct our terminologies, our, our um, epistemologies, Aboriginal standpoints from an Aboriginal standpoint perspective in the real, in, in, in the real truthful, most truthful and honest way we can do that without it becoming a kind of um, a new constructed discipline of whatever it is. I mean, you know, we've seen it for decades of Aboriginal studies or, or whatever it is, but largely those studies and teachings are, 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 um, are imbued with, uh, with non-Aboriginal perspectives. So that has to change. I really uh, want to, first of all, say that uh, I've, I've hosted many Sterling lectures. This is a unique one. 
Uh, we have never done this before virtually, although I, we would probably prefer not to have done that. Um, we've, I don't think we've ever done the, uh, the presentation and listened to the lecture um, off an SFU campus, and so that's a first. And, and this is just such a wonderful space to do this. Um, and it's the first time we've ever had a panel discussion. And I really want to thank our two panelists for the, all the value that you have added to this and, and the breadth and depth of, of your perspectives and thoughts have, have been really um, a, a great bonus this evening. So f finally, let me um, thank the folks who've got this uh, complex technology working uh, the committee who uh, had the difficult job of selecting uh, a winner for this year. And, and most of all, Tamara, I really want to thank you for your presentation. And, and I, I simply urge everybody to read your book. It, it is a wonderful book. It is, it is very disturbing for someone like me to read it, but I do think it's something that we all have to read. So thank you again for that work. And thank you again for your, uh, your generosity tonight in, in talking to us. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I, I wish we could. I wish we could hear the applause. <laughs> but uh, it was it was a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Online. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Bye bye. Thank you, Sharon and Irene. Bye.